someone contacted me who knows a lot about uh, some areas of Tesla manufacturing. Be related to Powerwall and Megapack, not just those two products, but those two products, maybe some Powerpack and some other things. The cost of making a Powerwall and the cost of making a Megapack, leaving out the batteries for a second, the cost of the rest of the hardware in a Powerwall or Megapack is surprisingly low. And the other part of the conversation was Tesla has not really engineered or optimized to to manage those costs and get them lower. But let's say they're currently spending a thousand dollars on the hardware for a power wall, the case, the electronics, whatever. When Tesla puts their mind to it and puts their engineering talent to it, they're probably going to get that cost down below five hundred dollars to maybe four hundred dollars because it's you know just a case and some electronics that's not really complicated. Same thing with Mega Pack that there's a structure to it. There's some electronics. It's important stuff. But once Tesla puts their mind to it, they're going to be able to vertically. It's not as vertically integrated as Tesla vehicles. And they're going to do more vertical integration like they just uh, announced their own. I think they're making their own inverter now, which maybe they weren't doing before. I have been puzzled. Elon talked about, I think it was at Battery Day, Elon and Drew talked about how the energy side of the business was going to be as big or bigger than the vehicle side of the business. And my general sense was, well, yeah, but the vehicle side is going to generate more profits because of higher margins in FSD, especially the margins from full self-driving. I got into, I started digging down into this rabbit hole of, well, what will the margins be? What will the profit be on energy? I've never really looked at that. I've looked at revenue, but I haven't looked at profit. Going forward, I'm not talking about right now, but going forward, I believe all of Tesla's grid storage devices will use lithium iron phosphate cells. If you follow battery day, the expectation is that the nickel based cells will get their costs down to around $60 a kilowatt hour, or $55 a kilowatt hour. Um, that's at the cell level. That's not at the pack or device level. Iron phosphate is significantly less expensive. The iron phosphate chemistry is significantly less expensive per kilowatt hour than nickel. I think it's less than half. Nickel's going to get down to $60 a kilowatt hour. If you figure lithium iron phosphate gets down to $40 a kilowatt hour, at $40 a kilowatt hour, a power wall has 13.5 kilowatt hours. So if you figure they up it to 15 kilowatt hours, it's $600 for the cells in a power wall. Add $400 for the hardware of the Powerwall and you're at $1,000. They're currently selling Powerwall for $7,500. I have an order in for three of them. to go. I'm, I'm ordered a solar roof and I'm going to get three Powerwalls with it and the Powerwalls are going to cost me $7,500 a piece. Well, that's, that's a lot of profit for Tesla. It's not a lot of profit yet because they're not getting their, their costs aren't down so low and they haven't scaled production, sales, and delivery. So right now, overhead... And everything else is keeping them. They're not even necessarily making a profit on Tesla energy yet. But when they scale and when they optimize for efficiency and when they start using iron phosphate batteries and they take all these steps, they're, they're going to get more than 50% margin on a product like Powerwall. With Megapack, it's a three megawatt hour uh, device. Well, three megawatt. And for people who don't understand, sorry, a, a key detail here. Nickel-based cells have higher energy density both by weight and by volume. So the same amount of kilowatt hours in a lithium iron phosphate cell might be this big. I'm making, I'm just using this for, I don't mean that the cell is actually this big. I'm just saying this, this is the size of a, let's say a kilowatt hour of lithium iron phosphate. And with nickel, it's, it's much smaller. It's actually less than half. The volumetric energy density is twice, more than twice as big with nickel. So they take up a lot less space. The iron phosphate devices take up a lot more space. But when you're doing mega pack, you don't care. When you're doing power wall, in most situations, you don't care. If you're talking about somebody who lives in a tiny home or a tiny apartment, maybe it matters. Like I have a three car garage. We don't use the third, third, the third garage. We have a lot of room in my garage. If I put four big power walls in there, three big power, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't notice the problem. So I think a lot of storage devices will go to iron phosphate because it saves money. It's also got a better cycle life than nickel based chemistries. That means it lasts, it has a longer life. And you can charge it to full without a problem. With nickel-based chemistries, when you charge to full, you degrade the life of the battery. With iron phosphate, you can charge to full, so you actually get more. Even if it has less capacity, you get more of the capacity. Anyway, with Megapack, at $40 a kilowatt hour, a 3 megawatt hour Megapack would be $120,000 in battery cells. And then there's extra hardware. Figure the extra hardware is five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 you're well under $150,000. They sell for like $750,000 to $900,000. So again, you have massive profits on a per unit basis once they scale production. And when do they scale production? When battery production scales. 
And when is battery production going to scale? Well, Tesla is scaling the Tesla side battery production. Uh, CATL is very clearly, if you search for CATL in the news, they are very clearly scaling their LFP, iron phosphate production. LG Chem is scaling their production. But the, the, the iron phosphate cells, I believe, are going to come primarily from CATL, a Chinese company. They are massively scaling growth of iron phosphate battery production. And iron phosphate does not have the same material shortages that nickel does. There's some concerns about whether there's enough nickel to support all the batteries Tesla and others want to make. But there's, you know, unlimited iron effectively. And there's unlimited phosphate. So you're looking at better than 50% margins for power wall, gross margins, not net margins, but gross margins. Better than 50% gross margins for power wall, better than 50% gross margins for mega pack. Power pack is probably similar. And you take that, and I'm working on models, which is, I'm going to be doing a video this week where I break down the profit story on the energy side. And it's just my initial spreadsheets. It's bigger than I thought. I thought, okay, energy will be um, a lot of Tesla's revenue, but won't be as much of its profit. All of a sudden, I'm rethinking that. So I see the margins being very high. I see the profits being very high on Tesla energy. And I wasn't aware of that before. So when I do my next set of models, which will probably be this week, it's hard to believe that somebody who's a Super Bowl like me can say this, but I think my my model is going to lead to even higher profits and even higher valuation. My previous forecasts of where Tesla's going could be understated and it could be worth even more than I thought. The Tesla vehicles are going to produce, you know, trillions, literally hundreds of billions in profit. And energy is also going to produce literally hundreds of billions in profit. And you're looking at an outrageous, and that's not even getting into, ro RoboTaxi is different. RoboTaxi is going to be more valuable, but it, it could be just, the, the potential here is insane. And that doesn't get into things like Dojo as a service. If Tesla offers AI training through the Dojo platform, once they're done with vehicles, once they're done with self-driving, that could be another huge chunk of revenue. So many, so much potential in Tesla. It's crazy. A, a number of people are mentioning that the storm in Texas is going to encourage a lot more people to buy power walls. There's no shortage of demand for power wall. The shortage, of, the shortage is batteries. Tesla needs to produce more batteries. CATL needs to produce more batteries. LG Chem, Panasonic. We need more batteries. Once we produce more batteries, we can make more power walls. The demand is already there. The d demand is there. People want it. But moving on to the transition topic, which I think is, this is something I think is really, really interesting. Model Y no longer has a standard range model available. Why is it? Some people are saying, well, it was too, it didn't have more than 250 miles of range. Elon didn't like that. I'm guessing not a lot of people were buying standard range. Tesla is managing, they have to manage Tesla through a period of incredibly rapid innovation. If you think about a typical car company, like a, I have a Volkswagen Passat with a four, with a four cylinder engine that's a two liter turbo, a 2018 model. In 2002, I had an Audi A4 that had basically the same engine, but they just taken a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of engineering and optimized the hell out of that engine. They've gotten a lot more out of it. So I now have a five-speed automatic transmission and I get probably 10 miles per gallon better gas mileage in my Passat. I don't have all-wheel drive, so that, that probably helps, but I get dramatically better gas mileage in a larger vehicle, more space inside from basically the same engine that has just been optimized relentlessly. But what that means is every year there's a slight improvement in the engine. And what we're about to see, like the jump from the Model 3 to the Model Y was a pretty big jump. The Model Y is a significantly better vehicle than the Model 3. You have the rear casting, you have more space inside, you have the heat pump, and those those changes are filtering back into Model 3 to some extent, but they haven't all yet. But we're about to see a bigger jump. In Texas and Berlin, we're going to see a Model Y that is dramatically better than the current Model Y. It's going to have front and rear castings. It's going to have structural battery pack. My guess is it's going to weigh 500 pounds less than the current Model Y being produced in Fremont and Shanghai. It's going to cost less to manufacture. Think about this challenge if you are Tesla. We're making this vehicle in Fremont. And it costs us, I'm going to make up the number. It costs us $40,000 to make it and we sell it for $45,000. We make $5,000 in profit on it. We've got this new vehicle that's way better. And it costs us $30,000 to make it. But we can't sell it for $40,000 because we'll be undercutting the other vehicle that's not as good that we're charging more for. I majored in mathematical economics at Rice University, and I was a PhD student at Stanford Business School for three years. And I don't know if there's ever been a case study of managing this kind of transition with this degree of rapid innovation. You know, if, just think about this. 
By the end of this year, Berlin and Texas will be spitting out Model Ys that are dramatically better, dramatically better. 500 pounds lighter, lower <clears throat> polar moment of inertia. The vehicle's gonna turn better. It's designed, the way it's designed, it's gonna turn better. It's gonna be safer because the batteries are more towards the interior of the vehicle. So many advantages to this vehicle compared to the current generation Model Y. How do you sell both at the same time? And you, well, you don't. Well, you do because the Texas version is going to have to scale. They're not, they're, they have to ramp up production. They won't be producing them in high volume right away. So you have this period of time where you're making the Model Y in Texas and you're making, you know, a thousand a month where you're making 5,000 a month in Fremont. At some point, you know, how do you price the more, the one that costs you more to make, but you're making it higher volume. And how do you price the newer one that costs you less to make, but is more valuable? It's just a huge problem. I've never seen somebody try to manage that problem before. I was wondering if the the vanishing standard range Model Y was a, was a step towards this transition or if that's totally unrelated, I don't know. After the new Model Y, the next set of factories, Elon talked about this with Sandy Monroe, there was this point where Elon was sort of talking about there's going to be a next generation of factory, right? It's all about the machine that builds the machine. So the machine that builds the machine in Berlin and Texas is the new, the current new generation machine. But the machine that's going to build the 2023 Tesla Compact, everyone's calling it the Model 2. I don't know why Elon said we're not calling it the Model 2, but everyone's calling it that. I call it the Tesla 2023 Compact. I think it's going to be compact. That's going to be the next generation vehicle. That's going to be a single frame casting, not casting front, rear, structural battery pack in the middle, but casting one piece and putting the structural battery pack in it. You know, eliminating a lot of robots, eliminating a lot of functions, making the vehicle much sturdier, stronger, rigid. And that next generation factory that's gonna make this vehicle is gonna have an even larger gigapress, probably. I know it's possible that the Cybertruck gigapress is gonna be big enough for this uh, 2023 compact. So, but so in 2023, which is not very far from now, right? You know, because we're the transition problem I'm talking about with Model Y and Model 3 relates to this. This transition problem takes us to the end of 2021. So in 2022, they're probably going to start building these new, this next generation factory. And then in 2023, they come out with a vehicle that is probably so good that you have to stop making the Model 3. And maybe you make an SUV version and you stop making the Model Y. You know, maybe it's, there might be an SUV variant of this and sort of like, well, we don't know what that vehicle is going to be, but it may be so good both in cost to produce and value to the customer that it doesn't no longer make sense to make the Model 3. So the Model 3 is a part of this transition. Like I sort of wonder, does it make sense to keep making Model 3s now? I believe they're putting a Model 3 line in Texas. Like why? Is there enough demand for Model 3 given that Model Y is so good. So there's a lot of transitions going on. Then there's another transition issue, which is Panasonic is making something like 35 gigawatt hours of 2170 and 18650 cells in Nevada. Tesla is transitioning to the 4680 cell. The 4680 cell is going to be, as far as I can tell, the cell for everything within three or four years. What do we do with the older generation of cells once the 4680 line starts spinning up at high speed? I mean, maybe you stick them in Powerwall because it doesn't matter. I don't know. I think that's a really, really interesting question. How do you manage this? You know, you try to put yourselves in the, in the heads of the people who are running Tesla, Elon and the other people running Tesla. Like, do you, at what point do you stop making the Model 3? Because the Model 3, you know, do you revamp the Model 3 line to have front and rear castings and structural pack? Or do you just say, you know what, by the time we get done with revamping Model 3 for all that, we're going to have the compact. Do you just stop making Model 3s? This transition is a fascinating challenge for Tesla. Please let me know what you think of this in the comments. Check out my other videos. Support this channel on Patreon. Check out the merchandise at elonbits.com, t-shirt, stainless steel, water bottle, and more. Check out my fair DUI book on Amazon. Links to everything in the description below. Thank you so much for watching.